Olivia. Um, <laughs> Uh, but she does not return his affection. She is in mourning for her brother, and her plan is to stay in mourning for seven years and not uh, see anybody, no male suitors, and certainly not uh, Orsino. Uh, then we have uh, Viola, who arrives uh, in Illyria after following a shipwreck, and she too assumes that she has lost her brother, her twin brother. Twin. I'll over there. Um, so she, she decides, as many female characters in Shakespeare play, decides to dress as a boy. Um, she dresses as a boy. She seeks and gains employment with the Count Orsino. Falls in love with him, uh, but of course cannot express her love. He, meanwhile, is sending her off to woo Olivia in his place, if you like. Uh, and Olivia is, is very much taken with this young boy and falls in love with him. This is where the diagram is really helpful. Because <laughs> <laughs> the play deals with uh, gender, um, and the obstacle in the play is that this girl is dressed as a boy um, and therefore cannot reveal himself to, to reveal herself to the man that she loves nor reveal herself to a woman who, who loves her. Um, <laughs> it made me feel like there is an interesting kind of conversation about, about gender. If that's all that's wrong is the gender, what's the problem? Well, to some people, not much. To other people, a great deal. So, so I wanted there to be a sense of, of genderness about the production, but without really making a, a concrete statement, because we are putting on this play which is complicated by the fact that it was once performed by all men, but we, but we no longer do that or need to do that. And so um, I started by auditioning uh, men and women for every single role in the play. And what I came to was I cast the actors that I thought were the best for the role. Sharon Lockwood, who's playing Malvolio, was simply my best idea for an actor who would bring the qualities that I was interested in. Malvolio, incredibly uh, icy cool, but very, very funny. Two qualities that are, are kind of sometimes hard to marry for, for an actor, but she really does that for me. And so uh, that was a decision that was just simply made by the best actor for the part. Uh, with Alex, um, I, one of the things that I uh, was not as wild about doing, which is what you often have to do when you do 12 flight, is find two actors who sort of look alike and are kind of the right height, and then you put them in costumes and wigs that make them look alike, but neither one of them looks very good. <laughs> so I thought, well, what can, what, how can I do, do this? And um, I'm looking at the play, and I realized that there's actually just one exchange between the brother and the sister, and it's a rather odd exchange. And Viola, in the last scene of the play, I don't, I'm not giving it away, no, you all know the play. <laughs> um, they, it, there's, a, there's a strange kind of distance with Viola in the, last, in the last pages of the play, where she says to her brother, let's not embrace until all is made clear by the sea captain and I get my dress. And then Orsino's like, I'll take your hand. Let's get that dress on you first. You know, so it's, it's, a very, it's very interesting the way that the play, and it's because it was uh, a boy playing a girl, and it, it gave me permission to try to pull off this theatrical feat. And it also gave me a very exciting opportunity to, to, to really show you a production where they actually look exactly alike. <laughs> favorite Shakespeare play uh, as well, and and Viola is such you know one of, I think one of the best characters in the whole canon. Uh, so it's 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 it was a, I didn't have to think for even you know two seconds. I, I knew right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've I've been in the play twice before, but as, as, as Viola. But uh, so it was a really exciting opportunity for me to play Olivia. Totally different world. Is it is it is it odd to be playing opposite a character that you know so well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's, it's very odd. But one of the things that I, I said to Mark.
harp on the first day was I was like, it's, I don't know, or very, very early on, I said, it's so interesting to hear so many of the same rhythms, rhythms that I, I felt like were my personal, yeah. well, I discovered that. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex found those too. <laughs> had to explore high and low and 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 the physicality and you want to do that but you don't want his performance to be all about going now I'm a girl now I'm a guy <laughs> and the play is so beautifully written that it, it you know you you don't have to focus on that I don't think any way that the play is done the audience has to do a little bit of the work you have to use your imagination to to tell the story so that when Dana did it She's so gorgeous. How could you not know that's a girl? <laughs> she's a she's a wonderful actress, so she's she you know she can play a girl playing a, a boy, and, uh, and and it's up to you to decide whether you can go along on the journey or not. Right? Because I started to think about Twelfth Night as the end of a holiday, the end of festivities. So for me, that sort of started to transform into the end of a time, at the end of a party. And so that really got me going because it feels like there, there is this, it, it takes place in this world that is going to change, that the, the two places in the play are Orsino's uh, place and, and Olivia's place. And they're sort of the centers of the landscape of the play, the geography of the play. And I was kind of interested in their, even the sense that their sort of privileged times are both very wealthy, they're both very indulged people. And so uh, I wanted to invest in that. Uh, Orsino is kind of unbelievably indulgent. One minute he's run hot, the next minute he's cold, he's filled with desire, he's filled with pain, he wants the music, wants the music stopped. Um, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be in this room. No, we're gonna run out into the, the field of flowers and roll around, and, and uh, so it's very sort of indulgent. So I have this idea of the end, the end of a party. Uh, the play opens to me at, at, at kind of the end of a party, the first scene of the play. It's late at night. There's a few kind of entourage people lying around. They're all kind of exhausted by him, but he's like, "Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going." Um, the same. In, but slightly different in Olivia's world, her party is her mourning. And the, the kind of indulgence with which she approaches that, even a, a sense of theatricalness about it. it, it and as we, we meet her in the play, her, her, she's growing tired of that party, of, of her mourning. Like, so we became inspired by like a, a house that had had a big wild party in it, uh, a bar at closing time, we also looked at like clubs, you know, discos and clubs, and how those those places have these kind of interesting lives where there'll be hundreds of people in line to get into a club, and across the street another club that's virtually empty. What is that about? And sort of it's just it's it's time is now, and the other one's time has passed. So. How do you resolve uh, Sebastian and his sister being on the stage at the same time? Come and see. Yeah. <laughs> 